Welcome back, Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor. I'm really happy to tell you that John Rubino is with us. We've had a little bit of a technical difficulty connecting with John, but he's with us finally, and we're very thankful that he's back with us. It's uh, the dollarcollapse.com for all that John does. Uh, thank you for joining us, John. Hey, Jay. Yeah, weird technical issues today. Can you hear me well enough to do this on the one yes, uh, I'm using? I'm hearing you very well. I'm hearing you very well. Okay, good. <laughs> That's, okay. Uh, you and I will have to have a talk about our, our Skype connection after this. I, yeah. I think the yeah. trouble might be at my end, but we'll see. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, I, I titled today's show, Note to the Fed, The Laws of Mathematics Still Apply. We've had a massive level of inflation, of course, in the financial markets, especially since the Fed began quantitative easing after the financial crisis 2008. And stocks and bonds have risen dramatically. I mean, just unbelievably, making some people very, very wealthy. Uh, and nobody seemed to care too much about that kind of inflation. Uh, but now we're getting a different kind of inflation, and it seems like all of a sudden the people that didn't seem to be concerned before are now very concerned. Why do you think the change? Well, let's put this bluntly. There, there's been a scam that's being run for the past, really, 30 or so years in which the big banks effectively took control of the government and they structured monetary and fiscal policy to enrich themselves, the bankers, the bankers' mm-hmm. favorite customers, and the politicians who the super rich um, finance in their campaigns. Um, mm-hmm. So what they've done is they've, um, you know, they take on any kind of risk imaginable, knowing that the Fed would bail them out. Um, and then when there is a crisis, the Fed bails them out by cutting interest rates, which impoverish savers, Mm-hmm. At the same time, that it enriches the already rich by making stocks and bonds and real estate go up. And that's what we've seen mm-hmm. for the last 30 years. And it's taken asset prices to absolutely crazy levels. But, but like you said, um, the system considers stocks, bonds, and real estate going up good inflation. But right. now, inflation is starting to spread out. It's starting to... Um, it's starting to impact food and cars and rent and the things that regular people have to buy. So we're, uh, you know, the rest of us are starting to figure out that there's a problem and that's risking uh, a complete destabilization of the system. So now, uh, you know, now the Fed is in that box that we've been talking about for such a long time where they either have to lean against this inflation by raising interest rates at the risk of blowing up the financial markets or let inflation run at the risk of it running out of control and blowing up the financial markets. So we'll see, but we're kind of at the decision point right now. Yeah. Well, that's what, you know, uh, Danielle DiMartino Booth recently said, the Fed can't afford to raise rates, but it can't afford, it cannot afford not to raise rates because of the two problems. It's in this box. It, there's no, apparently no easy way out. There's going to be some sort of day of reckoning in one direction or the other. But I have to ask you, John, you know, you and I, I mean, your dollar collapse thing was your book with, that you co-authored with, um, that you co-authored um, uh, with, um, geez, James my Turk. friend, James Turk, years ago, uh, in your website. Uh, you could see this coming in a way. I mean, those of us, here's, here's the question I'm getting at. For years and years, it seemed to be people understood a long time ago that when money is created, when the money supply increases, it increases inflation. Why do you think citizens, you know, I mean, you said it's a scam. Well, it's a scam because the, the citizens have allowed the politicians and the bankers to get away with it, right? So it seems to be a disconnect, a lack of understanding of this very basic, I mean, it's almost so elementary. Why don't people understand, why have they not understood that when the Federal Reserve increases money, it's not going to result in not only inflation, but a lot of other really bad things? Well, the, the, the basic principle at work here is debt, which yeah. feels really good at first and, then, and only bites you after you've accumulated way too much of it. So we've been living, you know, every, every adult American has spent their entire lives living in an environment where debt um, gave pleasure, basically. In other words, the government had the ability to borrow money and create money out of thin air and do things with it that people perceived to be good without mm-hmm. any of the, uh, the really bad side effects. So mm-hmm. now we're at the, uh, the later stage in the process when the bad side effects start to bite. So it, it shouldn't be a surprise that uh, people who have grown up their entire lives in a fiat currency system, which didn't, they didn't perceive to be a problem, never bothered to learn about 
the nature of money and mm-hmm. the effects of debt because it was never a front burner issue for them. It was never necessary. Mm-hmm. So now um, we all have to educate ourselves about what money is, what role it plays in society, how it should be structured, what, you know, what constitutes good money versus bad money, all that stuff that people used to just kind of intuitively understand mm-hmm. is, uh, is a body of knowledge we have to acquire and it's going to be a painful process. You don't really, you know, as a human being, you don't learn new things unless you're forced to. <laughs> and we're going to be forced to learn these painful lessons uh, going forward here. And, it, you know, it's already starting. People are, are I'm, I'm hearing from more liberal friends who never thought about this stuff in the past um, asking me um, how to buy silver now. Because, you know, mm-hmm. conservatives and gold bugs and libertarians kind of got this for a while. Yeah. But, um, People who considered the government to be a force for good in the world and trusted the monetary authorities and who therefore didn't pay a lot of attention to this, they're starting to pay attention now because their costs are going up and the instability that, that's out there is becoming more and more obvious to them. So I think it's a really broad-based awakening that's happening right now. And you know what? Not a moment too soon. Yeah, well, I was going to say, if it's not too late already, uh, given the situation we just talked about, the Federal Reserve being in the box it's in, uh, which way do you think it will go, John? I mean, here we have interest rates that are, I think, 1.75 or something like that I saw a little bit ago on the 10-year Treasury. I think we have a Fed funds rate, if I'm not mistaken, of about a quarter of 1%. And I think we saw a Fed funds rate go up to nearly 20% when Paul Volcker, you know, when when the last time we had a serious inflation problem, and, of course, we know uh, that was a very deep recession, but we climbed out of it all right. We had a couple of decades of, of growth and, you know, good economy because we paid a price for it. But how much further, the equity market, I haven't watched it in the last hour or so, but how much, how much further can rates rise before we start having a real serious problem in the equity markets? Well, you can basically simplify the, this whole world right now to one number. The uh, yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury bond, Mm -hmm. there's a point beyond which that yield will blow up the financial system because so many other things key off of the 10-year Treasury bond, and so much debt and so many derivatives have been created that only work while interest rates are relatively low. So we don't know what that number is on the 10-year Treasury bond that's going to blow up the financial system, but the Fed... Yeah, is because it has to raise interest rates, has to push us in that direction. Mm-hmm. And they hope without pushing us beyond the number that, uh, that, that brings everything to a halt, but they don't know what that number is either. And I suspect it's not that high. You know, we're at, uh, what, 1.74, I think, today, the yield on the 10-year Treasury. Let's, let's say it goes up to two and a quarter, which is historically still pretty low. Yeah. If it goes to that we will see some very serious effects from that because it makes mortgages get more expensive and it, it makes interest rate derivatives um, way more unstable and lots of other things. So uh, let's say we, we go there, which we could easily go there with inflation at 6 or 7%. Uh, that might be enough right there to give us a gigantic taper tantrum, you know, where stocks and bonds just tank in value or stocks at least tank in value. Uh, and the Fed is forced to back off. But if it has to back off and say, okay, we're done tightening, you know, now we're going to go back to, you know, pushing short-term interest rates down and everything in the face of inflation that is 6 or 7 or 8%, depending on the measure that you're looking at, uh, that is a, a historically um, scary event, you know, because it's never happened during the fiat currency experiment. The, the central banks were always able to push interest rates down in a deflationary environment. In other words, when stock prices crashed and that started to make everybody be afraid of prices actually going down instead of up, um, then easy money was justified and it wasn't too scary. But if inflation is already high and rising and the Fed starts easing again because it's afraid of the stock market tanking, uh, and that's a whole different thing. You know, that uh, mm-hmm. that is possibly the, the end of the fiat currency experiment. You know, it might be that crazy in the financial markets. And we might see it here pretty soon. You know, that might be a 2022 story since the Fed is apparently promising to raise interest rates next month or the month after. Um, you know, we, we could be 
seeing what we're talking about happening now actually happen sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. Well, I just looked at the uh, at the tenure, and it's uh, one point seven eight three now. It's up uh, 0.05, or five basis points on the day. And I see that the uh, the Nasdaq is starting down again, uh, down two percent. It was a, it was worse earlier today, but I mean, it's just really uh, kind of scary because here's the problem. You know, it, uh, not I, we're paying the piper now, so to speak, as you as you were suggesting, and. Uh, when the Fed pushes money into the system, it pushes interest rates down. And as you say, savers get punished. And then, you know, mute, uh, funds, the funds, the pension funds and the like have to get returns. Think about life insurance companies. They have to be able to have cash flow and returns to, to meet the, you know, the, the demands from, from their people. Uh, and they, and where are they going to go? Well, they're going out in, in the stock market. So if the equity market starts to tank, those things can go belly up. And I know that um, Michael Oliver was pretty concerned about, and he was keeping his eye on some of the junk bond ETFs as well, because that's where a lot of those funds are, municipal bonds and so forth. So, I mean, it really is a very serious thing. Not only low interest rates result in malinvestment. People do foolish things when they can get money for nothing, don't have to pay for it. So they go out and take all kinds of speculative risks and then, you know, when the economy implodes, those things all go to money heaven. So, I mean, this is really a very serious situation, I think. So I guess the real question is, with just a few minutes left to go here, what should we be doing? What should average investors be doing right now, John? And, and, you know, some people thought cryptocurrencies would be, especially younger people. Younger people said, wait a minute, the Fed is creating all this money after 2008, the financial crisis. Is This is really... This is ridiculous. We don't want our savings to go to zero. Let's get into Bitcoin, which has a limited supply at least, you know. But the cryptos have not been keeping up very well uh, with the uh, uh, with 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 the with anything. Uh, they're up a little bit today. I see some of them are, but they've really taken a hit versus gold. What are your thoughts? And and then maybe what do you think in general? Where should people be going? What should they be doing right now? Obviously, staying out of debt, but beyond that. Well, yeah, you want to get as far away from financial assets as possible. That is, don't, you know, don't be buying bond funds right now. Try not to, to uh, own any more dollar cash than you have to and, and move your extra money into real assets. You know, gold and silver, various kinds of real estate, energy assets, things like that that governments can't just inflate away. Now, cryptos are uh, an emerging asset class that, uh, you know, we're still figuring out what it is and what role it plays in the monetary system. And right now, the big crypto coins, Bitcoin and Ethereum and uh, a few of the others, they trade like tech stocks. In other words, they're mm-hmm. risk-on assets. When people are excited, they buy cryptos just like they might buy Apple or Google or Netflix yeah. or, or Tesla. Um, so they tend to trade um, in line with the NASDAQ. Uh, whereas gold, you know, the contrast between gold and Bitcoin lately has been astounding. But gold is just sitting there. You know, it's it's right in its range in the 1800s where it's been for a couple of years now. Um, so it's impervious to all the stuff that's happening out there, at least at the moment, whereas um, Bitcoin is extremely volatile. Uh, so if you want stability, um, right now you still want physical assets. So gold and silver should be your money. Um, and, uh, you know, cryptos may work out. They may be this, this brilliant new innovation that ends up dominating the monetary system. But right now, they're, they're risky assets that, uh, that can go way up and can go way down. So there's a place for that in a portfolio. But if you're looking for protection, in other words, return of capital rather than return on capital, gold and silver are probably the place to be right this minute. Mm-hmm. So as you and, said, gold and the is just stocks, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, the mining stocks, of course, are a different ball game. They're a different risk profile. Uh, there, you need to make money when you're pulling stuff out of the ground. But um, so, but anyway, gold is just sitting there. Uh, silver is a little more volatile. But uh, what do you think then? Do we have to? You, what do you think might be the catalyst to drive the precious metal stocks significantly higher? Because as you say, they're just pretty much sitting there now. Okay, the the catalyst that just sends these things to the moon, precious metals, is when the Fed capitulates this time. In other words, when the financial markets get crazier and crazier and more and more volatile and scary, and the Fed 
turns around and says, oh, we're not going to ease anymore. You know, we'll, we'll start actually cutting rates going forward and we'll, we'll increase QE and, uh, and all of that stuff that you love in the financial markets. We're going to go back to doing it again. Uh, and if they do that in the face of inflation that's way above target, then people are going to conclude that we will never have tight monetary policy or even normal monetary policy again, and it's easy money to the horizon. Uh, and that's it, paradise for precious metals. You know, everybody's going to want real money when that happens. And, um, you know, global investable capital is maybe 100 times as big as the market for gold and silver. So there's going to be a ton of money trying to move through a very small door into these mm-hmm. thinly traded metals, and it will, it will send them way higher from where they are. So that's when precious metals actually become a, you know, capital gains generating asset rather than a preservation of capital asset. Yeah, Doug, Doug Casey says it's like uh, Niagara Falls through a garden hose. That's what he, is he, yeah. what he equates it to. So, and I think that the uh, mining stocks obviously will do well. Uh, especially, well, the producers that are making a lot of money now, I think, are finally going to have their day when people look around and realize uh, how good they are. And those companies that are finding the big deposits, and we have a number of them that we're following, uh, will also do extremely well. John, I want to thank you so much for for being with us again, and uh, we'll look to do it again sometime in the near future, hopefully. Great. Thanks, Jack. 